Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'll talk to you. Don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's, it, well, it's, it's nice to, to, I mean, once in a while to, to be invited to, to be invited home. Mm. I, I, I um, as much as uh, I spend time at the manor, uh, cutting all the rollers with my home. Um, that's the, the place that gave me the, that's where I got my training at Cardinal in, in, in everything, literally. You know, when I, when I speak to people, uh, I am, um, sometimes I say to people, I am an, an honorary West Indian. <laughs> because when I came to this country um, in 91, the, the community that embraced me was the, the West Indian community, I, you know, and, and, and to be honest, that's, I have lived um, in this community more than I have lived at home. So once in a while, I mean, I, I can, as, as, as African as I am, which I truly am, I sometimes, you know, I, I identify with the, the family that I am part of. So Jesus feeds the 5,000. Um, the passage says when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew, he withdrew by boat private, privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the, the, the crowds followed him on foot from, from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and this is already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and, and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. In John's account, in John 6 verse 8, he says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother said to him, there is a lad here with five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them and broke the loaves. And he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken fish, uh, pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were 5,000 men besides women and children. Let us pray. Father, this is your time. Let nobody see me but see you. And I pray, Lord, that you steal my nerves, you steal my heart, and that you, you strengthen my resolve, oh God. Let me be a mouthpiece for what you want your people to hear. Jesus, I pray. Amen. I am a child of the Pan-African era. When people ask me, sometimes I say I am a product of Pan-Africanism. For those who don't know what Pan-Africanism is, it's a, 
for me, I, I put it simply as the love of my people from where, wherever they are born. People who share this, the same hue as me. That's what Pan-African, Pan-Africans usually believe. Um, maybe that is the reason I am so stubborn. The reason I dislike bullies. The reason I love my people wherever they are born. I knew things were bad when we had to walk on the other side of the, of the road whilst uh, white people walked on the other. When I was growing up. I remember as a five-year-old, um, a police car stopping outside my house and they set a dog on my aunt as she walked from my grand aunt's homestead, uh, while, which was literally about 100 to 200 meters away from, from my grandparents' home. I grew up in the country, countryside, you know, like back, back country, not in the town. I didn't grow up in the city. That was my, my first encounter with injustice. I am in my 50s now. And the same is still the same conversations that we are having in this era. And it's worldwide, it's nothing new. For those who have not caught up with the story, John the Baptist has been killed. If you read, you know, like uh, the few passages before, before the one that was chosen for, for for today's message, John Baptist, John the Baptist has been killed. When Jesus hears this, he withdraws by boat privately to a solitary place. This was the same John who Isaiah speaks of in Isaiah 40, verse 3. For those with their Bibles, you can follow. Isaiah 40, verse 3. It says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The same John who had left in the womb of Elizabeth when Mary, who was pregnant with Jesus, came to visit. If you remember, John was his cousin. The very same John who had baptized him Sometimes at the loss of a loved one, you do not want anybody around. You want to, re to retreat to a place of solitude. In my imagination, I think Jesus wanted to retreat and mourn. Remember, he was a man as much as, as he is God. He was still clothed in his manly flesh. He also retreat, retreated to spend time with his father, his heavenly father, to make sense of the death of John. And who can make sense of death except God? To be honest, death does not make sense for those who, 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 who are like me. It took eight minutes and 46 seconds. This past year has been fraught with so much loss of life that it is easy to want to retreat to a place away from what seems like an untenable situation. Many of us have been or are still there. The, that darkened precarious place, devoid of comfort. Sometimes the people, of, the people around us just want us to get over with it. Even, in our, even ourselves in our attempt to resume a, a sense of normalcy, we rush the process, the process of healing. We have COVID on one side and the knee of racism and injustice on the neck of our existence on the other. Anxiety, depression, and mental health issues are rife for many of us. And as much 
as there is talk of the easing of the lockdown, it is difficult to be optimistic. Crime is on the rise and, and people are engaged in what possibly is, can only be termed as irrational behavior. These are definitely unprecedented times. Jesus needed his time to process. I never knew the term cousin until I came to this part of the world. For me, my cousin is my brother. My niece is my daughter. My nephew is my son. If my uncle is younger than my father, it can be termed as a young father, like Ubabomnani, for those who speak the same language as me, Ubabomnani, which means the younger father, or Ubabom Dala, meaning the uncle who is older than my father. It is the same with my on my mother's side, Umamomnani, meaning the younger mother, or Umamom Dala, meaning my auntie who is older than my mom. So John was. Jesus' brother. How many of us are running on empty because we are busy existing that we have not taken time, taken time to evaluate our existence? We are, today is the, I mean, we, we mental health, I mean, Nadine mentioned the fact that it's, we are, mental health week or day or yeah but how many of us have taken time to look at our mental health during this crazy time how many of us are actually can turn around and say we are crazy how many of us can say that because, you know, like sometimes we know that certain behaviors in ourselves, we can recognize certain behaviors in ourselves, which some people can term, term as irrational. And to be honest, this past year has tested every part of my resolve. Um, Jesus need a time to process. One of the words that seem to be popular nowadays is self-love or a regard for one's happiness or advantage. I am not advocating that Jesus' retreat was an act of self-love, but think about it though. In Mark 12, verse 30 and 31, for those with their Bibles, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then 31 says, the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than this. Okay, self-love. Some people, I mean, I've heard this being said that if you do not look after yourself, you cannot look after anyone. You are not good for anyone. If you are running on empty, how can you pour out into others? Think about it. The only thing, my mental health is the most precious thing that, is, that I do possess. The crowd followed him. They had lost their shepherd. Cause remember John was a big thing. He was a big deal. John was a big deal. Cause John actually was before Jesus. He heralded, he heralded the, the coming of Jesus. 
if you remember. He had baptized Jesus. You remember that scene where the, the, the Holy Spirit comes from heaven like a dove and a voice comes and say, a voice is heard that says, this is my son in whom I am pleased. You remember that scene? So John was a big deal. I'm just excited thinking about the very fact that John, can you imagine being the, he was like Jesus' hype man. For, for, for young people will, will understand this. In hip hop music, you have this guy who basically um, hypes up the, the main act. You know, like even, uh, um, no, I won't go into that. <laughs> So the crowd followed him. They had lost their shepherd. Zechariah 7, 13 verse 7 says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. I will turn my hand against the little ones. When the leader is gone, there is always a moment of confusion. Because, you know, the people knew that John had been murdered. Well, John had been beheaded. John had been killed. For no apparent reason except to please because the, the, the king at the time wanted to please this young lady who was dancing in front of him. You remember the saying, right? This is a fact. I was born the same year the American government murdered Fred Hampton. For those who don't know who Fred Hampton is, he, he was this 21-year-old who was the chairman of the, uh, of, the, of the chapter of the Black Panther movement in Illinois. I don't, I really don't get, you know, like I'm a, I'm a pro, as a journalist and as a, a lover of history, sometimes I'm, I'm just amazed, you know, like in, in how, how consistent it has been in, in uh, when, especially in the Americas and some other parts of the world where, you know, sort of so many of the black leaders and activists are killed by by the state and it's just like normal death is not normal that's what i'm saying it's not normal from slavery to to current policing laws of the western world keep them locked up in jail and they won't be around to raise their children keep them in low income housing and schools vilify them by classing them as hooligans and hoodlums and instead of having chains around their necks have them around their minds. These are things I think about. I think one of the things that, that this pandemic has actually done for us is give us time to think. This is a time where we are looking because our neighbors are no longer in our face. We are actually looking at our neighbors. We are suddenly listening instead of just seeing. And I have seen protests in America, even to, right down to South Africa. Right now, we have the, the debacle in Israel and, and the whole Palestine thing. I, I get so frustrated when I see injustice. I am that kind of guy. So John the Baptist has gone, and Jesus felt the loss. Verse 14 of the passage says, when Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. John 3 verse 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the God to verse, which encapsulates the enormity of God's love for us. There is no instance in the Bible where those who came across, those who came across Jesus left unchanged. 
I think what the world needs now, and I remember a song that says, what the world needs now, the reality is <laughs> what the world needs now, now is really love. That's the reality. That's one thing I'm, I'm, I'm understanding is without love, we are not doing this thing called life in its proper way. Love is about bringing the best in others. I wonder if anybody can dispute that. that. Will I love my children and I love my boys so in my love for them, I want them to be the best versions of themselves. And I'm sure you love your kids too. You want them to be the best, so you invest in them, you, you nurture them, you feed them, you clothe them, you want them to be the best versions of themselves. I wonder if our mandate in our daily work as Christians, are we bringing out the best in each other? Because that's what love is. And they say love is who God is. When we look at the narrative and the personage of Jesus, everyone he came across or we experienced him were changed. The fishermen became evangelists. The blind got 2020 vision. The lame walked and the dead came to life. Now evening is approaching. The disciples come to him and say, this is a remote place, a desert, so to speak. And it's already getting late. Send the crowds away and so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. That sounds like church. How many people have come to us asking for many things and we signposted them to to other services instead of giving them what they need. I remember, you know, years ago, you know, I have, a, I, have a, I, have a, I have a memory that sometimes, you know, I wish I could forget many things. I remember a discussion we had a while back. I don't know whether it was AYS or, or what have you, but I remember somebody says, you know, if a, if a guy in the city center comes to you smelling of booze and of, of alcohol, and, and ask for money. Oh, somebody, you know, disheveled and, and then comes to, to the church and, and asks for money or for something. And I remember people saying, well, you know what? You should give them, you should send them to places like Banados or shelter or whatever you, uh, or, or even, uh, what's the other one? The, the um, Salvation Army. No one said, you know, the person has every right to come to us. Because if you remember the church in the past was a sanctuary for everyone. There was a time when people came to the church for sanctuary. Now it's changed. It's like now it's like, it's like pick out what's, what's best for me. That one, has good music. That one has a preacher who, who will moonwalk on the pulpit. That one will say whatever I want to hear. So no longer, that's why you're finding that young people are saying that church, church is irrelevant because We have positioned ourselves. I think sometimes we have positioned ourselves in that way that we are not really serving a need. We are just occupying until he comes. I was lucky to, to document, you know, um, some of the things that have been happening through the pandemic. I remember coming to Katano and finding some diligent ladies, young ladies without fail every Sunday, come rain or shine, they will be outside the church collecting food and, and giving away what they could. They will go and, 
and they made and they, they 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 became part of a network of of other providers in Sheffield. To me, I I let me tell you, I am um, I strive on that because to me that's news. That's news, good news. That's that's exactly what we Christians should be doing. I was so impressed by by these sisters. I mean, I wish I stayed around, you know, to to be part of that small core group of people doing stuff. And I'm sure every Sunday they are still doing things. Because I remember speaking to one of them and, and she said to me, she says, I couldn't wait for church to make a decision about whether we feed the homeless or not. Because by the time they had made the decisions, lockdown will be over. And to me, that was a very, very a valid point. We miss an opportunity as Christians to do what we are supposed to do until it's late. And then suddenly we leave off, what if? It's a very, it's a terrible place to be at as a Christian living on what ifs. James 2 verse 14 to 18 says, what good is it my brothers if someone says he is faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. I was reminiscing on on growing up, the fact that uh, everywhere I went to, the, I always had food. You know, every family, I grew up at a time where you could go to somebody's house and if they were having a meal, there seemed to be a plate there waiting for you. Even if you were unannounced, the un uninvited guest, Things were simpler then for me. I think life was a little bit simpler. I know sometimes we talk about the good old days. And to be honest, sometimes the good old days were not that good. And they were not that great. But sometimes we reminisce on the good old days as if they were better than some of the days now. At least now we are, we have a, a reference point in, 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 in which to shape our behavior now. You know, we can look at the past and say, oh, yeah, 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 but that, that wasn't great. So we can change it. So Jesus replied to them and said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Cut and all, you give them something to eat. That's what God said. He says, you give them something to eat. That is your job to give them something to eat. They shouldn't be hungry. You give them something to eat. It is your duty. So in John's account, I like John's, uh, John's account because it basically is the crux of my message today. The other stuff was a preamble, but the crux of my message is, is the account of John where he says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, say to him, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Um, Jesus fed the 5,000 from a young person's willingness to share his packed lunch. Think about it. I had, a, um, I was listening to a young gospel artist say, young people want to be talked to and not preached at. I will go on to say that as a church, we are failing our young people because of our inability to listen. There is not enough young people who are willing to pass information to adults because that platform is closed. 
I remember it was David Zaid when he came to Cardinal years ago who said that there is an age divide, there is an age gap, there is an age divide, the young and the old. They, he said, I remember if I, I, I'm paraphrasing, he said, imagine, he said the devil does not like it. That's why he has created this divide between the old and the young. Imagine the wisdom of the old and the energy of the young. If you bring those two together, it's a powerful combination. But all we need to do is start listening to each other. I think young people are afraid to tell the, the older people that in, in what they are going through, their experiences, their concerns, um, they are issues because they don't want to be judged. I don't know if it was it was cut and all. I spoke about the uh, there is a research written by this. Um, uh, it, it was written by this lady at um, San Diego University. I think she's called Jin uh, Jin Duen. I, I, I'm butchering S N M. I think, but she says that this new generation, this this. This, this, this generation that is born with their, with their smartphones on their, in their hands, this generation, if world peace is gonna come to pass, it, would, it will be through this generation. You know, this, this generation that comes with, with genes that show their underpants and, and their hair is multicolored and, 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 and strange and strange to us. They look like, sometimes they look like cockatoos or, or pirates, that generation. If world peace is gonna come, it's because of them. Because one thing that has been found is that when that generation stand behind the cause, they go to it fully and deeply. Look at the Black Lives Matter movement. It was young people of all colors, of all races, of all persuasions. They didn't care. They had the cause to stand behind and they are sticking to it. As much as we are frustrated by, by their energy and stuff, but they are standing behind what they believe in. Look at that young lady. What's that young lady uh, who is an eco warrior? Yeah, that young lady who, she's standing behind what she believes in. She believes in in, 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 in the environment and, and making sure that, that, that we are looking after our environment and we are treating this, this world in a kind way. They are standing behind what they believe in. And that young lady has spoken to leaders of wealth, of the world. You see what I'm saying? 15 year old kid having a platform to channel her energy because one thing, I'm sure her parents encouraged her and they nurtured her and made sure that, you know, she, she values herself. Imagine if we did that to our young people in church. Imagine when we give them the platform and we support them, they come in with, their, with, with their, an issue that they are interested in and we rally behind them as a, as a church family because there's nothing as important as a church family. I told you right at the beginning that my training ground was at the church. So when I started working for the conference, it was a fulfillment of that very training at Cardinal Seventh-day Adventist Church. The platformers I was given. When I used to film with film programs and sometimes we'll, we, will, we will burn DVDs and those DVDs, I'm, I'm sure they're still somewhere in my shed. Some of them, you know, we, 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 we burned so many, we copied so many that we didn't have enough people to give them to. See what I'm saying? So the training ground has always been church. I think our young people, will be, after all we say, you know, our, 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 it's our children are our future. And yet, 
become a typical Sabbath service. There is no young person in that, in that, in that, uh, you know, in that program. When is the last time that the program was made actually, which featured, featured, I'll say probably 60% of young people and then just like a few of our, of us gray heads, you know, sprinkled by, you know, just to make sure that we, you know, we keep an eye. It's okay, it's okay to keep an eye, but let's nurture them. Cause I know, let me tell you, I'm, I'm at that age where all I'm thinking of is my legacy. <laughs> what legacy am I leaving behind? I, I know, one thing I know is I don't have money to leave my children. So, so the idea is at least if I have a legacy, if I have done something that impacts the community in which I live, then chances are when people see my son when I'm gone, they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 that's, that's Lungani's boy. You know what I'm saying? So then it's like you build influence, you, you nurture your community, you, you build your community so that your children can live in a community that upholds the same value systems that you have. So really, as somebody said, I was listening to somebody says, you are necessary. As a Seventh Day Adventist, you are necessary. Maureen gave, gave us some history about how, us, it's giving us some history about how us as Adventists, there's a lot of impact that we have done. But how much of that impact do our young people know? How much? How, how often do you sit down with your young ones or your nephews and nieces or, and just talk about the accomplishments of the Seventh Day Adventist Church worldwide? The hospitals, the schools. I know we don't have schools in this country, but think about it. So, I, I tell, I'm 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 I, I I'm aware time is gone, so I'm 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 gonna I'm I'm gonna wrap it up and and close. Chapter seventeen says we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. They answered. Matthew's account is typical of how we have taken the young people out of the conversation. Because remember, in John. In John, John basically says there is a young lad here with two fishes and five loaves and five barley loaves. But Matthew does not mention that. Basically, somebody, one of the disciples says, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish. And to me, it just basically went ding, 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 because I'm thinking Matthew's account is typical of how we take young people out of the equation. We don't mention them. The lack of acknowledge of, of the young boy's contribution is, is the reason that our young people feel undervalued in church. The disconnect that young people feel is the reason why we are sometimes classed as irrelevant as a church. I was raised by my grandparents, and I think I've told so many people about that. I grew up at the feet of my seniors. I love the senior generation. They lived the history. They possess the history within themselves. Sometimes, if you don't like reading, all you have to do is to sit in front of your grandmother and they will tell you, or grandmother or grandfather, and they will tell you the history that you need to know about yourself, about the community in which you're growing in. You see what I'm saying? Imagine if cutting all young people with their smart devices and, 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 and whatever platforms they are on, if they could curate and celebrate the stories of their elders. Imagine, just with an iPhone, you can change the world. Now you can start telling stories of which are important and pertinent to you, stories you can pass on. I mean, we talk about citizen journalism. 
imagine if our young people at Cattenau started instead of spending more their heads down, you know, texting each other, but they, they use this great machine that they have at their disposal to start finding out about their grandparents. Because we are all grandparents of them at Cattenau. If, if you're old enough to have a child who can have a child, you are a grandparent. I already call myself a grandparent. And I love that. The moment my hair started turning gray, I knew that, you know, grandparent time is here. And besides, Benjamin is, well, it's a matter of time, you know, before he leaves my home and starts his own. I pray. So I have learned that if we, have, if we haven't learned anything that in the past 14 months, we have been starved of interaction and, 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 and conversations and, you know, the, the conversation that will help us to weather the storm, God forbid that there is another, there is another lockdown. Imagine if we had stories about the very generations that we have lost in the last 14 months. We wouldn't be suffering the heartaches that we are suffering now because many people didn't even get to bury their own. They didn't even get to speak with their own. Now my question is today, what are you doing with your two fish and five loaves? That's my question. What are you doing with your two fish and five loaves? What has God given you that you can share with the world? The little boy, the little boy with these two fish and five loaves gives it to Jesus. And Jesus did amazing things with it. The little that he gave to Jesus, Jesus connected that little with heaven. And it impacted 5,000 men. Remember, the Bible says it was men, not counting women and children. And remember, it was, it was customary for some of the, that generation who had more than one wife. Imagine. I'm sure there were probably 10,000 other people outside the 5,000. Think about it. Because some people, they brought their, their wives their, and their concubines, well, not their concubines, but they, they brought their wives and their children. Think about it. The impact, two fish and five loaves. Now the question is, to muse over this afternoon, as you evaluate or as you evaluate your life throughout the week, what are you doing with your two fish and five loaves? Child of God. What are you doing with it? Who are you encouraging with that two fish and five loaves? Who are you feeding? You know, I am, I'm a filmmaker um, and a photographer. And we have often, I've often, you know, kind of spoken to people, you know, like sometimes people call what I do a ministry. <laughs> they call it a ministry, especially when they don't want to pay me. But that's besides the point. So if I had not picked up that camera, and, and to be honest, I was self-taught. I was self-taught. I learned everything. Actually, I was an actor first. I worked in films. I mean, like many, many other films, you know, with, Big people and yeah, but that's in the past. By observing, I learned how to do what I do. So, and to me, I credit all that to God because God saw that he, I was interested in certain things and he started learning. He, he started bringing people into my, into my life who, who could show me what they could do. And 
And now I, I lead a department at a, at a conference and I am doing the very same thing to young people. I have more volunteers who are, who are young. When I see a young person who shows promise or who is interested in picking up a camera or in, in doing whatever that has to do with media or communications, I am at my elements when I, I have young people like that. I, I, I'm looking forward to the time when I'm in my 70s, 80s, and I'm still, and I'm still probably, I can hardly see what my camera sees, but I am still going to be doing what I'm doing because that's what God taught me. And that's my two fishes and five loaves. So as we finish, I've taken too much of your time. If you don't remember anything that I have said today, love is the only thing that will turn this world around. And two, if you say you love people, what are you doing to enrich their lives? When people come to you, do they live feeling enriched? When they come to you, do they live feeling better about themselves? If people hate to be in your presence, maybe you're doing this Christian thing wrong. Maybe. I, I'm, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, correct me. You know, but I think this whole injustice and the racism, whatever, and, and whatever, all this contention that we see is because we have stopped, stopped loving people as they should. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and the last time I, I checked, I, I, I don't hate me. I may probably sometimes look at my, at my waistline and see a little bit more love handles and say, you know, I need to tweak that, but I don't hate me. And as a result, when I meet the people I meet, I love them before they even utter a word because as a Christian, that's my mandate. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't matter whether you're short, tall, black, white, and blue and green. To me, once we strike a conversation, we are family. And sometimes I get frustrated when people say, oh, I hate this person, I hate that, or whatever. As much as I get frustrated, the truth is, at the core of what I do, I do what I do because I want us to get to heaven. Imagine, I want us to get to heaven. Imagine the conversation we'll have when we meet Jesus. Imagine how we will reminisce about how crazy life was. And especially when we meet those people, we thought we'll never be in heaven because we had already judged them on this earth. You know, we, we do that sometimes, you know, say, oh, yeah, that person is no good. That young person is no good. But imagine, I'm, I'm excited about heaven for that very thing. So if we don't meet on Zoom or we don't meet in Cardinal and Jesus decides to come back this afternoon for either you and me, make sure we meet under the, near the, the Supermalt River, the one that's next to the mango tree in heaven. So make sure that we meet there. And I'm sure there will be like a tree that has 12 different, I mean, they say that there's a tree with different fruits. Me, I know they, there's gonna be like a tree with cake, probably with super melt and, and some other stuff that I like. But I think God can do that. I'm, I'm a believer in God, you know, I love Jesus. And, and I just hope we realize that our love for Jesus, makes us better Christians. 
if you don't like other people and you say you like Jesus, you know, that's a lie. I will end there. Maybe next time, I mean, we can continue on something else. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's, it's been a whirlwind of thoughts and ideas. And, and, and I just hope that out of the jumble that came out of my mouth and, and that's on my, on my iPad and, 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 and computer that somebody will have caught something. And that is that you are coming back soon. And that you want us to use our two fish and five loaves in this, in this current climate. Because that's all we can give. We don't have much except the little that you have equipped us with. And I know you want us to share it. And we know once we connect with you, this kingdom is one. So thank you, Lord, for, for another Sabbath day in which we can just sit down and just look at how awesome you are. Because I know you are an awesome God, mighty and awesome. So thank you, Lord, for every hair that's bowed here. And even those who are were not able to, to be part of this, that the recording, when they get access to the recording, that they will be blessed also. And they will know that, Father, we want to save you. So thank you. And thank you again. Amen. <music>